Hello, everybody, and welcome to the We're So Young podcast's official first episode. My name is Diana Garley, and our first guest is Brianna Opst. She is an actor. She is a clown. She is a world traveler, an Australian, and just a kid who never really grew up, but is probably the most adult kid I ever I've ever met. <laughs> Excellent uh, introduction. Yeah. All right. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Bree. Uh, well, I'm an actor, a clown, um, an Australian, and a kid that never grew up, <laughs> 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 trying to get by adulting. Uh, that's yeah. That basically sums me up. Uh, uh, I don't know um, how to describe myself. I mean, who am I? It's a very big question. Yeah. And I was asked that question actually about seven or eight months ago and refused to answer it because it's it's so big and vague. <laughs> but That's fine. Next time <laughs> someone asks you, you could just like, hey, here's this podcast. You should yeah. listen to it. Here I am. <laughs> here's everything about me. Um, I don't know. I'm just a, a person just uh, plodding along in this thing we call life and uh, in trying to – I'm just someone who likes to try and – Capture the moment and be in each moment and whatever. I don't know. Just like not grow up. Just, yeah. I actually found out this year how old you actually were. Because <laughs> I did the math, but I've known you for years. And I remember being like, I don't know how old she is, but she's, I know she's older than me. Yeah, um, I'm old. <laughs> You're not old. You're so young. Uh, yes, we're so young. <laughs> Podcast. Um, okay, so... You are an actor. You've been acting all your life, according to your mom's Facebook posts. Yes. <laughs> my mom, if you want to ever find out about me, you probably should just uh, friend my mother on Facebook. She loves to post about so many me. gems. It's great. <laughs> um, yes, so my I, I started acting, I guess, at the age of seven. Um, and it was by choice. Uh, my parents were very supportive of both my brother and I, like choosing our own hobbies and um, extracurricular activities growing up. And my mum took me to see a play, it was Les Mis was the first show I ever saw. An interesting choice for a, a seven year old. <laughs> and uh, I do remember during the show, there was a point where I like leaned over and I was like, mom, uh, is there any uh, speaking in this play? She's like, uh, no, it's all singing. So once I dealt with that and processed that, it was, Pretty good, and I remember very distinctly at the end of the show um, when we're like applauding and the, um, the actors are taking their bows and everything, turning to my mum and saying to her, uh, I think I'd like to do this. And she was like, uh, okay. And she had been in her heyday, my mum tap dances still, but in her heyday, she um, was involved with like the local community theater company in my hometown and she was like oh well they're auditioning for their their summer show and so I auditioned with um a little Shirley Temple song on the good ship lollipop oh was my first Do ever you want to give us a, a demonstration <laughs> on the good ship lollipop etc etc so <laughs> I pretty much and my I did some actions I think I choreographed my own little dance for it uh, I, of course, got cast with such a talent like Oh, that. yes. <laughs> uh, it was Alice in Wonderland. I played a card in a village just in the ensemble. But Dream role card. Oh, oh yeah, my dream role. <laughs> <laughs> I was so little in it, um, even though I was, I was seven, six or seven, um, but I was a little seven-year-old. I was so little. Like in Australia, when you first learn to drive, you have to have um, – a yellow, a black and yellow L on the on your car window, to show that you are, are learning with somebody. You got somebody in the car with you. So, you know, if you have aggressive drivers, they might actually be like, "Oh, that's a learner." Uh, but I was so little as a card, uh, they put a little learner's plate on me because they're <laughs> like, "She's just learning to be a card." Um, but that was basically when it, I started and. I thoroughly enjoyed it and then I asked if I could do drama classes. So I did drama classes um, outside of school for about 10 years, I guess, and then just kept doing shows and through my drama classes I got an agent. Um, so I did a little bit of 
child acting, um, <laughs> which is always funny. Recently, my father put all my VHSs onto uh, onto DVDs and so forth. Oh, so. can we see those? Can you send us a clip? I'll put it on the website. I, I'm not sure <laughs> about that, but maybe I'll I'll have a look. I get I, for me like even now to this I have always like hated watching myself doing oh, yeah. any film and TV. I really just cringe. So I. I did Spanish soap operas, so you can imagine that. I know. I've tried to look for them. Thank goodness you can't find it. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. I think I need to talk to El Boilo. Oh, no. (laughs) I'll show you some on my own accord. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I I, I have much more of a love for for live theater because you you can't relive the moments. They just happen. (laughs) Yes. So, yeah, that's I start at 7 and... And still to this day, I'm, I'm doing it. Um, and, and going back to, like, my, my parents, like, both my brother and I are working in fields that we started in at, like, young age, like, the fields that were, like, our hobbies and so forth. And I think that's a real, I, you know, I, I mean, I think it's possibly, like, personality um, of my, both my brother and I, but I think it's also a testament to, like, our parents letting us like find our way and be yeah definitely supportive you know the only thing my parents suggested when I went off to uh, uni we say college um, was that like you know maybe you should have be doing things that also can um, be a backup and so forth so on top of doing you know basically a theater degree it's called creative arts um, I did an education degree and and that skill set has helped me too. Like that's how I first came over to the States was with teaching. Um, and also, you know, what I do now, uh, I guess we can get into that in a little bit, but at the Miami Children's Museum, um, my education background has really supported my role here as well. So, yeah. So you actually started working for a company in Australia, the Tours. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you got that, how many places you've traveled? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's a very awesome theatre company in Australia that actually just turned 40 this year. And I was back home um, just recently and got to crash their Christmas party, which I was thrilled about. Um, They are called Polyglot Theatre Company, um, and their motto is uh, theatre is child's play. And... uh, I got involved with them through a friend, so it's good to know people and be friendly with people. Uh, they first, uh, what well, they toured in the US, I think it was their first tour of the US in 2009, and I was living here, and two of my best friends, one of which was running the theatre company at the time, and another was acting in the company, um, were both going to be in DC. So I was like, oh, I'll come up for the weekend, see the performance, and hang out with you guys. And my, my best friend, he was like, oh, who was running the company, what if you uh, come up and work? I'll pay you for your hotel and uh, and you just work the gig. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And uh, what was awesome about it was the artistic director of the co- theatre company was there. And uh, so I, I hit it off with her. And then from there, she was the one pushing for me to join any of their US tours. Uh, while I was living over here and then I was living back home for a year and a half and got to tour with them to uh, Korea and I toured for four months with them all around Australia getting to explore some really cool places that were never on my list or probably not many people's list to go see like you know this small town in the middle of Western Australia Uh, but we definitely got to hit up some pretty cool places touring with them and Korea was awesome and have also just toured all over the the US with that company and yeah they do pretty pretty different and unique work and uh, what's really nice is like all the artists that um, work for the company are all on the the same wavelength they're all like big kids and therefore um, you know they're there for the kids and making um, the opportunity for the kids to create and so forth and it's it's less traditional theatre. It's these big, big scale outdoor uh, play spaces, I guess is what they call. Some are indoors as well now. Uh, and 
you know, basically one of them is called We Built This City and it's a and usually an outdoor space of 5,000 cardboard box city. That's and so cool. It's I've really seen awesome. videos of that. It's yeah. so cool. And I'll, it, I'll put the link to the yeah. theater company on the... Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, if you get to check out their work or any of their videos, you just see, you know, it's all about kids being in control and they get to transform a public space or a, a, a theater foyer or, a you know, a black box theater uh, with you know, very simple mediums, like one shows cover boxes, as I mentioned, one's like balls of elastic, one's paper and tape. And as performers, you are basically there as facilitators, you know, you, you get to be a performer, you know, like a construction worker in the cover box city, or like somebody from this elastic tangly world. Um, but really, your job is there just to facilitate and play along with kids and their ideas, you know, if they want to build a a giant tower then you can help them out if you want but it's always letting them you know be in charge and take control so if you know you can totally see a tower is going to fall of cardboard boxes you just you sort of let it happen uh you know because it's it's about the the kids just you know running the show kind of thing there's something so beautiful about kids in general just because they have such an imagination that us as adults we tend to lose i don't think you've lost it but like i think that you know, just it's it's common to have lost that creativity. And so being able to work with kids and just kind of see them, it just kind of sparks this whole other side of your brain. You know? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I'm a big believer that kids, children, or when we were kids, is the most imaginative and creative human beings that we will ever be. And so for me to be able to, like, surround myself with kids... And, and that kind of imaginative, creative play, I think, definitely has kept me being young myself because they just, you know, have wild, crazy imaginations. And I think especially when you're making theatre for kids, like involving kids in the process, which this theatre company does, and that's something, you know, I've tried to bring here to the, the Miami Children's Museum. Yeah, talk about what you what do you do here at the Children's yeah, Museum. Yeah, so I... We're um, recording at the Children's Museum. That's we are see. live <laughs> here at the museum. That's why we say here. Don't tell anyone I'm on the clock. Uh, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> basically what I do here at the Children's Museum, my official title is, um, what is my, oh, Manager of Theatrical and Early Childhood Experiences. You're just my boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's people's boss. Um, so what I do is I manage the theatre department and I do our early childhood programming. And our theatre department gets to make plays for kids uh, which is pretty awesome and our shows are either based on picture storybooks or on uh, exhibits that we have here and um, yeah and I think that the kind of theatre we do is is possibly unique I, I feel like the in ge- I'm probably generalizing and stereotyping but in general children's theatre here in America uh, is kind of one sort of stream of theatre and uh what I like to try and do is is like uh, sometimes I, f- I find children's theater to be patronizing and talking down to kids and uh, you know as I said before like kids are, are so creative and imaginative you don't need to s- spell things out for them their their imagination and their brains will go with you on the journey you, you know you have to trust in the fact that they can imagine you know you're on a deserted island or in a bedroom or this bearded 20 year old is playing a 10 year old right now and kids will go with you and believe you and so there's no need to have you know the theater that you make for them to be like you know slowing it down dumbing it down I, I don't believe in going down to the level of children like children will you know <laughs> there's no going down with them like it's your <clears throat> they're there with you um and their level is no lower. In fact, you know, their creative level is, is probably much higher than most adults that we that we all know. I'm drinking water. So, yeah, so one thing I, I you know, tried to bring to our, our team here at the museum is using the kids to help create the shows. So we have awesome access to, we have a preschool here at the museum, we have the general public, we have a elementary school. So we have, we're surrounded by children. So we involve them in the process, whether it's like an initial making process, 
getting ideas from them and then, you know, basically steal the children's ideas or having them, you know, having them give us feedback, like on a, a new story we're trying to tell through song. How was that song? What should we do? You know, and you have honest kids like, it was really long. I'm like, great, we will make that shorter. <laughs> it was good, but too loud. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, I mean, kids are also very honest. So yeah. we involve them in the process, like, you know, from the beginning of creation of a, a story, of a, a show or a story, uh, right through to you know, we use them for dress rehearsals and, and get their feedback and and so forth. So, do you think you've acquired some sort of skill from from kids aside from having an excellent name and memory? That is true. Yes, I, I <laughs> you can. can see a kid once like three months ago and like say hi to him in passing and like three months later you're like hey John <laughs> everyone looks at you like what what yes how do I know I for some I think it's you know I've, I've always worked with kids like since I was um 18 when I was 18 I started to run my own drama school back home in Australia as my part-time job <laughs> so I've always worked with kids in in some capacity I guess and so you started it yes okay talk about that yeah yeah so I um yeah, I, so I, I graduated high school and then while I was in high school, I had done this um, big Shakespeare program throughout my last year of high school. And it was like a competition at like a regional level, state level. And then um, a few people got selected to go to a national level, um, not competition, it turned into a, a show. So all these high school kids from around Australia got together for a week or two in Canberra, which is our capital city that no one's heard of. Um, uh, and made a, a Shakespeare show in a week. And then from there, four of us were lucky enough to be chosen to go work over um, for a month in London to work at the Shakespeare's Globe there and put on a, a show there. And part of my reason for being chosen was I wrote in my proposal that I would bring back what I learned <laughs> to children in my community. And uh, so when I got chosen and I went and I came back, I'm like, well, I guess I better honour this proposal. So I worked with a local uh, elementary school um, and did a, about like a basically a, a 10 week uh, Shakespeare workshop with uh, third and fourth graders. And uh, we put on a little show and it was really awesome and great exposing children so young to, to Shakespeare and theatre. And two weeks into that program, the principal came up to me and was like, oh, we'd like to keep you on after this because <laughs> I was just volunteering. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. He's like, yeah, I want you to work with every um, year level here at the school and teaching drama. I'm like, okay, great. And then a couple more weeks into the program, he's like, oh, do you want to be doing um, some after school drama classes? And I was like, yeah, I'd like to do that. So it started with just being like an extracurricular thing with the school. Um, and then after my first year, I had had interest from, uh, from people outside of the school, kids outside of the school I had started to hear about like what we were doing. So I asked the principal, I was like, oh, hey, do you mind if I like make it my own thing um, and, and bring in kids from outside of the school? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. So it was great. It was awesome because I had no overheads. Like the school was like, that's fine, use the space. And uh, so, yeah, and then I, I basically had a, a drama school with, I uh, ended up, by the time I ended, like closed the, the drama school, um, I had about 100 students, which is like pretty crazy. It was like 80 to 100 students. And it was like the perfect, perfect job for getting through, getting through college because I could make my own schedule right you know it was like it was after school hours but you know sometimes it was like Mondays Wednesdays Thursdays the next semester was Monday Tuesday Wednesdays you know um so I was doing that on top of still and I would teach like one full day a week at the the elementary school and as that's well. great too because you would wow. learn things and then make it for kids and yeah. yeah absolutely so yeah so I did that yeah I did it for I guess it was my um, my first three years, so I had my um, creative arts degree, and then I left and traveled the world for six months, and then came back and still <laughs> had kids interested in doing drama. So I did it for another year for when I was doing my education degree, 
But basically when I took on full-time teaching work, which is what I did once I finished studying, traveling and studying for the time, not finished, never finished traveling and studying. Um, I, it, it was kind of too much to be like first year teaching as well as like running a drama school. I was just, it was a little bit overwhelming. So I, I stopped, but it was a good four, four and a half year stint of. That's amazing. Playing I didn't know with that kids about you. every yeah. afternoon. That's yeah. Amazing. And it was great. And just, you know, that ended up being my, my part-time job, which was great. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So where did you travel? You left <clears throat> for six months. Ugh. You I guys, did. yes, such a non-American way of thinking, and it's so beautiful. <laughs> it is, and it's 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 not uncommon for Australia. Um, you know, it's that that idea of do you live to work or work to live kind of thing. And the, one of the perfect examples is one of my uh, to my good friends here in in America went to honeymoon in New Zealand and Australia. And before they left America, the people were like, oh, how long are you going for? And they're like, three weeks. And Americans are like, oh, wow, lucky for some. And by the time they get to New Zealand, Australia, everyone's like, that's it? That's all? You're only here for three weeks? And so, I mean, that's the perfect example of just the, the different way of thinking. And also, you know, most full-time jobs in Australia, you start with um, four weeks in vacation. And here in America, you know, you start with a week kind of yeah. thing. And so it's a very different way of thinking. Um, yeah, which is very hard for me to adjust to. I'm s- still struggling. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, but that's, I'm still struggling. <laughs> um, so, yes, so when I finished my first degree, <clears throat> I took six months off to just go backpacking. Um, had saved up a bit of money uh, through my drama school and, and so forth. And so I took off to Europe first, and I um, went through the UK first, so Scotland and trained, caught the train down through the UK. And then I initially was meant to go with a friend and the last minute the, the friend couldn't um, go. So uh, I booked like a, a month uh, bus tour through Europe just to sort of like get my feet wet kind of thing and get comfortable traveling because it was the first time I'd um, done a big trip like this. So I after that I went through the UK, I did the month uh, organized tour and from there I met some great people who were like oh I'm going to Ireland next and I was like okay that sounds like fun I want to go to Ireland so <laughs> go to Ireland for a week and then they were like oh then we're going to go to Prague and Berlin and like oh yeah I like the idea of that let's do that so did you initially <clears throat> know you were going to leave for six months or you were just yes like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I had booked my <laughs> around the world ticket basically okay. that's it so over to um, it was like a trip to, to London New York, LA, back home to Melbourne was what was the only things officially booked. Okay. Oh, and the the month on the organized tour. So everything else was like just making it up as I went along. I was like, oh, that sounds good. Oh yeah, do that. Um, So yeah, and then I I then spent some time in the the States and um, a little bit in Canada. Um, Yeah, and then went back home after that, so. Yeah, that's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but it's a it's a very common thing for for Aussies to do that. Um, either as soon as they leave high school to take a, a gap year or um, or six months, um, or after they finish uh, uni to to do that. It's it's not uncommon. You, I think it's just so important as humans, you know, to like see other cultures and just your your whole world is expanded. You know, oh, when yeah. you see when you just just <clears throat> going outside of your comfort zone and seeing how everyone is the same and so different yeah yeah, I yeah think it's absolutely so yeah for sure and it's yeah I mean you travel anywhere especially in Europe or any you know you go to a backpackers or a hotel or you know you're gonna f- talk to any tourist in the street you're gonna find there's gonna be a lot of Australians out there it's a it's a really nice unique part of our culture and I don't know why why it is that way or why it's so ingrained um, I think part of it is <clears throat> often here in the states when they learn I'm from Australia they're like oh my god that's so far yada yada it's like well for Australia we're so isolated that everything is far right so something being far is no excuse like we can go to New Zealand which is great our neighbors um and we have some islands close and Southeast Asia is not too far maybe between 
five hours to, to nine, depending where you're going. Um, but yeah, everything is far for us. So it's not an excuse. Do you think it's funny if people in South Florida are saying that because everything is far for us here too. We're like, yeah, I get no, but like you know, it's it's not not that far over to Europe from here, kind of thing. Yeah, or you know, um, or down to South America. It, yeah, it's yeah, everything for us like to get to Europe is, you know, it's a twelve-hour flight and then a nine-hour flight or something like that. And it's a super long way from Miami to to Australia too. right? Yeah, it is. Where I just did that trip. <clears throat> last week came back from visiting family in Australia and yeah it's it, it's a minimum 20 21 flying hours let alone layovers and everything yeah, so that's nuts yes. so what <clears throat> brought you here to Miami to live here <laughs> <laughs> to Miami Florida wow it's a very good question I, I, I mean I just t- obviously spoke about my my backpacking and in between um, <clears throat> working in Australia and, and studying, I had also done some other trips. Like I spent a month in South Africa one summer. Um, I had come a couple of times over to this, the States for different things. And so obviously I have travel in me. And the thing for me was I wanted to actually like live and work somewhere as opposed to pass through and to part of it was to want just that experience of um, you know another culture or another way of life and part of it was also just to put myself outside my comfort zone and see what that was like um, and I chose the US uh, for a couple of reasons one because I knew I was going on my own so I knew <laughs> and I was packing up life uh, so I knew I'd already be out of my comfort zone so I wanted an English speaking country so that language um wasn't yet another barrier which is interesting Miami uh, but <laughs> we'll get to when I arrived in Miami um and then the other thing was uh, it's really easy and common for Australians to go to Canada and the UK um but I didn't want to be necessarily s- surrounded by so many Australians um which is no no offense <laughs> it was just like I just wanted to be like something as completely different as possible and and naturally Australians have uh, you know a similar kind of personality or a way of life kind of thing so it's easy to be drawn to each other and go like oh all right well let's just go to the local Aussie pub you know for drinks or or whatever so yeah I didn't want to do the UK uh, Canada thing so I was like, well, let me try the U.S. And I had ha- I have a family friend up in Fort Lauderdale, so it was kind of a base to begin with. And I came over. I knew I was going to teach over here because it was an easy way to, to, you know, make money and, and get a visa, actually, <laughs> it was the main thing. Um, you have to find work before you're able to apply for a, a visa. How long were you planning before you came? Planning to come here? Mm-hmm. Um, I knew once I finished... I think once I had gotten back from my six months away, I had sort of decided I wanted to live and work. So I made like a three year plan because I had my one year education degree to do. And then I was going to get teaching experience in Australia. So I taught for two years um, in an elementary school. Uh, Actually the one that I had started at when I was 18, the the principal there was like, as soon as you get qualified, you can be here full time. I was like, sweet, I'll do that. Uh, so I wanted to get, you know, teaching uh, experience in Australia first, uh, so that would look good on the, the resume and just not be completely foreign <laughs> to the, the field of work. So it was like basically a three-year plan. So after I taught for two years, I and, and the principal knew that that was my plan. I sort of handed in my resignation. I was like, I'm off. Um, and then I had, I'm trying to think, I came over in April, so I had like a... a three or four months or so of just like you know getting everything together and researching schools and lining up job interviews and so forth and my plan was to come in April you know because most schools hire before the summer and um, yeah so I started in Fort Lauderdale and I had researched all a bunch of schools and it was easier for me to go through 
the private school system just in terms of getting certified and and everything and transferring over you know my uni degree and and all that business so I basically had a list of all Broward County, Miami-Dade County private schools and would go on their websites and see if they were hiring, see what kind of drama program they would have. So I wasn't sure if I was doing going to do high school drama or um, teach elementary, so I was applying for both. Uh, yeah, and then the, my big thing was like, I'm going to give myself a year. I only was like, I'll go for a year and see what happens. And I ended up having, it was, it was funny because I had, quite a few job offers and it was like three or four maybe and I had no idea really what I was choosing between because I you know there's only <clears throat> a certain impression that you can get from an interview or a tour of the school or right. a, you know they make you do a, a practice teach kind of thing you know so you, I was really just going with the vibe and um, the school I, I chose was the the right one it, I, you know it, it had a good fun friendly feeling and so yeah and that one year ended up turning into four and a half because <laughs> I was like I still like this I'll stay I still like this I'll renew my visa I'll still like this so yeah and then the the, the big reason that I um, left was that I ended up quitting teaching after I so I'd been at the school for three years and um, had was subbing for the fourth year and I was trying to put my creative stuff at the the forefront of everything Um, because I had this focus on wanting to live and work um, overseas and travel so like I said teaching was the easiest way to do that but so that teaching had been at the forefront of um, my career and I was still doing you know theatre and creative stuff and I was teaching creative stuff but I had never really in my adult life put theatre first and so I was like all right I'm quitting teaching and you know I'll use it to supplement income in terms of you know subbing or whatever um but in the end I had to to leave because my visa had run out and so I couldn't renew my visa to do theater work because there's no you know it doesn't work that way it doesn't work there's no official employee that's just gonna (laughs) do that so yeah I ended up choosing that decision was tricky because I ended up choosing what I wanted to do over where I wanted to be because I felt like I still wanted to be in Miami um, but I couldn't be pursuing um, to the full extent a theatre career so to speak so I ended up moving back home to Australia to to do theatre work and I did it you know very successfully um, for a year and a half and then I ended up getting a green card so I was like well this is a sign I guess I can move back and that was now almost five years ago, which is really crazy Yeah, that, to think. I met you like a year after you'd moved back the second time. Yeah. 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 So that was about five years ago. So I get to be where I want to be and, um, you know, be pursuing a career that I, I want to be doing, I guess. Yeah. At and the same time. Yeah. And I mean, like your survival job, and I say that with air quotes, is so related with creating you know it's theater we're creating things and we create shows and it's just so it's so nice and then you also act as a professional actor outside of here and you have that luxury to be able to do both we both have that luxury and Mm -hmm. that's just like it's unheard of for Diana has a really good boss that lets her do that yeah yeah that boss hey um that's me new year (laughs) pay raise (laughs) oh oh, wow we're negotiating here (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely think that making theatre for kids is, you know, will probably close to one of my, my dream jobs, you know, and if I get the opportunity to do some other professional actor work outside of my job, that's a bonus for me. And, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily see the need for myself to be doing back-to-back shows outside of what we do here at the museum. Um we're doing back-to-back shows here anyway (laughs) yes we are exactly and you know for me doing the outside um the the other professional work is just like keeping the craft you know alive and and learning and upskilling myself and um but I I love what we do here and very passionate about making theater for kids and making good theater for kids that's you know just for them and Mm -hmm. so yeah my day job is great (laughs) so aside from your whole visa thing because I'm sure that was really stressful 
you know, moving is a huge, huge transition. What are some challenges, like life challenges, that you feel like you felt? How old were you when you first moved here? When I first moved here, I was 26. 26. Yes, I was 26. Do the math, everybody. Uh, Yes, so I was 26. Um, Challenges. There's logistical challenges like packing. What do you pack when you pack up your life? Uh, I mean, because initially it wasn't so hard because I was like, I'm just going for a year. Right. You know, it should be okay. But then once I had set up life here for four and a half years and then moved back, it's like, well, what am I taking with me back? Like, what do I get rid of? What do I ship? Yeah, you have a whole life. <laughs> what do and I as, put as in a suitcase? Adult, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so that was really interesting. And I think if I did that over again, I would have sold more stuff. You know, I, yeah. um, I also, I honestly thought that I was going back for good. And when I say good, I, of course, I would travel back here. But I, I thought that this chapter of my life was over. And so, which was really hard uh, because, you know, saying goodbye to all the connections that I had made here and so forth, it was, it was like, uh, you know, it's never going to be the same. Um, so, yeah, logistics of, of packing. And then when I moved back over, I was like, oh, wow. And setting up life again and starting yeah. from scratch again. Um, so was it hard at first, like kind of being completely alone over here? When I f- You're so social, I don't Yeah, it's like- when I first moved, because I had the, the family friend to stay with, it was okay, and I managed to... I know people say Miami's a tricky place to, to make friends and meet people, but I managed to fall into, like, a great group of people, and it was through the, the work at the school, um, and then I started to play Frisbee, Ultimate Frisbee, and so there was, like, a whole bunch of those friends, and then I did theatre stuff, so then it was those people, so... You know, I had these sort of three circles of great people. Um, so it wasn't hard. Like the, the first month or so, you know, when I'm like uh, job interviewing and trying to figure out who, who, and what job to take and so forth. And uh, it was a little bit lonely, but um, yeah, it, it, it didn't, it didn't phase me. I didn't really question it, but yeah. It was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me right now, the challenge is like having been back and forth is that no matter where I am right now and probably forever, I've signed up for a life of long distance. So uh, if I'm living here in the States, you know, I'm leaving behind my family and um, friends there and vice versa when I was living over in Australia I'm leaving behind the friends here so it's you know I've had way more goodbye parties than anyone should have in their their lifetime and had way too many uh goodbyes at the airport um between whether it's been moving or just visits and so that I mean that's the hardest thing I'm always um not not disappointing but I'm always upsetting somebody because I'm I'm not there and that's it's a it's a tricky thing to to deal with and a heavy thing to 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 have but it's also i'm making these choices right so i need to be okay with all the emotions of myself and and those around me um it's not to say that it's easy uh but it is definitely very tricky uh when you you know leave somebody and you're crying at the airport and they are crying and yeah it's it's a hard thing but it's it's these are my choices so you know we we live with them and process with them and right. deal and and everything but it's it's definitely that the biggest challenge is, is the people and and trying to stay in contact with people you know regularly or you know that but I have you know amazing friends like back home that you know, maybe I haven't spoken to in a couple of years, but I just saw them right now, you know, like a couple of weeks ago and we hit it off and the friendship is, is still the same and yeah. amazing. And so, yeah, it's just the long distance factor and the, the people is, 
is the trickiest. But I, I do think that some of my relationships are, are better, uh, not better, but just have progressed in a different way, I think. You build a stronger of, foundation because yeah. you are far away. You have no other choice to, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. So, but, yeah, definitely the it's the the people because, yeah, you're always, you know, you know, you're always upsetting somebody, right. you know, no matter what, unfortunately. But, you know. So I have a random surprise, or not surprise, I lurked you and uh, really dove deep into, into internet Brianna. Oh, wow. And I found a Facebook note that you made a year after you'd moved here of things that you've learned. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I think it's amazing. It's like, it was like over 40 things, I think, but I took a lot of them out because a lot of them had other people's names. Okay. Yep. So I, I chose... some in-jokes. Yeah, yeah. Some oh, in-jokes, wow. you know, but we're going to, we're going to listen to these. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this young 20... 27-year-old Brie. 28-year-old Brie. Wow. Uh, how old were you in 2010? In 2010, I was, in two, I'm doing some math here. It was April 16th, 2010. I was 27? Yeah. So this, coming, is, yeah. Huh, this is 27-year-old Brie. Wow. Number one, if you let your guard down with people, you'll build a stronger and deeper bond. Yeah, that's true. Number two, jump shots are the best kind of photos. Absolutely. Still agree. <laughs> Friends can be found in the most unexpected places and within the most unexpected people. Mm-hmm. I can jump super high while clapping coconuts together. Oh, I can. Yes. Good technique and a high level of fitness is needed to play to play ultimate frisbee. Yes. Beaches are beautiful. The bump is a dance that should be repeated. <laughs> <laughs> Nuns can come in all shapes, sizes, and personalities. Yeah. I, I worked at a Catholic school when I first moved here. Yes. <laughs> Someone or something is always watching over us. I must trust in this. Mm-hmm. Even at 27, themed dress-up parties are still the most fun. Mm-hmm. Malibu and pineapple is, has never let me down. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I never puked on that. <laughs> Rickshaw rides are the best $20 ever spent. Yeah. Americans love their holidays, and so do I. Uh-huh. Uh, you can never guess what people are thinking unless they tell you, then it's not guessing. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. A night at the piano bar is always a good night out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Drunk dialing Australia isn't that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Friends and family will always be loved will always be loved and love you back no matter how great the distance or time spent apart. Mm-hmm. Tradition says when you catch a bouquet at a wedding, the guy whom catches the garter will slide, up the, slide the garter up your leg in the middle of the dance floor. Did yeah. you not know this? I didn't know this, and I was so excited that I caught the, the bouquet, <laughs> and then I was so confused when they're like, sit in the middle here. No. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I'm never going to catch a bouquet. I'm just going to be like, <laughs> I'm going to be that person who's like, watches it fly over her uh, head. And I'm like, because I'm a little bit competitive, so I was like, <laughs> yeah, got it. I was so excited. Yeah. And then. Turning no. around. <laughs> not so excited. Uh, you do need courage to change the things you can. Mm-hmm. It is okay to cry. Pranks need to be thought through, otherwise they can backfire. Mm, yes. Downtime is a good thing. I will shake my booty in the name of competition. Yes. I've mm-hmm. seen you do this. Mm-hmm. I do have talents worth sh- sharing. Traveling and finding adventure is one of my favorite things to do. Mm-hmm. And the last one is, I have so much to learn from the people around me as they have so much to teach me. Yeah. Wow, I was a wise 20-something. What a 27-year-old <laughs> wise wow. woman. Yeah, okay. What What wise <laughs> advice do you have to that 27-year-old? Wow. Yeah. I feel like I'm still... Wow. That's great. <laughs> I haven't read that in uh, whatever since... 2010 maybe um wow I I think that like maybe I I learnt these things but I am still practicing them I mean some things are fact like jump shots are the best photos to take 
Um, Malibu pineapple still hasn't let you down. Yeah, I, I've moved. I haven't had a Malibu pineapple in a while. Um, I would have. Br- I actually thought about bringing <laughs> it, but we're we're at the children's museum, and I was like, I think that's pushing it. Yeah, that might be pushing <laughs> it. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, definitely. I, I and you know what? Because I I think when I moved here, you know, it was the first time. You know, I, I like I talk about like going out of your comfort zone, and so. It was a little bit of <clears throat> self-discovery. And when people say say to me, oh, what do you like about Miami? What do you like you know, about being here? Why have you stayed so long? And there's a, just a feeling of I like who I am here is often the answer I give. And I can't tell you how different it is in what ways than the person I was or the person I am back home. But there's something about who I am here and the person I am here that I like and I mean I like myself in Australia but I, I, I don't know how really to explain it or I can't pinpoint it um, so I, I do think like when I first moved here <laughs> writing that list was this this like all right my hands are in the air I'm gonna just do everything try everything everything was new people were new and so it was just a, a big learning experience for for myself and who I was and but a, a lot of those things, you know, I feel like I'm still practicing or re- reassuring myself. Like, you know, it's okay to cry. I get accused of being a robot sometimes, <laughs> more often than not. And, um, you know, or, um, you know, they're, they're letting your guard down. You know, I, I feel sometimes I am can still be, be guarded with people. Um, and I, I think you have to be guarded with some people Definitely. depending on you know, situation, circumstance, you know, colleagues versus best friends, you know, versus a stranger, you know. Um, but I know that sometimes people have said, you know, I'm hard to get to know kind of thing sometimes. And so I, I think I'm better at, le- at letting that guard down or, or letting people in. Um but again, that's still, I think, something that I'm practicing and, and, you know, training myself to be better at. But I, I think, I guess my advice to my 27-year-old self is, like, is keep keep learning and keep practicing these things and, and telling yourself, you know, this list of things you've learned is, is not the end. Because once you've learned something, you know, it's not like, okay, well, I learned that, moving on, right. you know. Um, yeah, and it's having, I guess, learnt those things about myself and, you know, some are, are, are fun things as well. Obviously, um, I, I, you know, I, I got to, it, over the, the my first four and a half years here, just be learn more about myself and be okay with who I am. And, you know, not everything like uh, my first <clears throat> stint living here, there, there was a bit of a rough phase and I wanted to leave and quit and not be here anymore Um, but I stuck through it and I'm glad that I did because yeah I learned a lot from that experience and just yeah just you know I I am at the core happy with the the person that I am even though you know still you know editing and fixing and learning and practicing being a better person but that's what yeah. keeps you young you know what I mean is that is that acceptance that you're still learning and you're still changing and you're mm-hmm. st- you know and I think that that's so important to remember because that's that's what that's essentially what keeps you young yeah. is that acceptance that you're still learning you're still growing you're still a human and like just being okay with that yeah absolutely you know? and I think that one of my biggest takeaways with like my mentality I think maybe that it's different here I'm not sure really if it's different when I'm here it's over there I'm not sure but definitely when I moved here I had like I said like threw my hands up and was like I'm just gonna do things like I I can't say no because I don't think I'll like it because I don't know because everything is new and so definitely that kind of attitude has like you know like I still have it of like okay yeah I'll do that that sounds like fun yeah like okay yeah I'll try that you know um so yeah I I like to say that you know within reason I'm up for for most things and 
willing to to give something a shot even if it's out of my comfort zone or out of my norm um or if it just sounds like fun then you know do you feel like that's the way that you coped with moving here just like being like yes sure yeah definitely I I think so um yeah and and like I said it goes back to like these are these are my choices you know and I'm lucky to have friends and family on both sides of the world that that support the choice like I'm surrounded by good people who just want me to be happy even if my decisions aren't necessarily the, the decisions they would like for me um but ultimately at the core everybody wants to see me happy and when they see me happy then you know it, it works so you know just you know these are my the, yeah these are my choices and um I'm living them, you know, I, I'm choosing to be here, so, which is a big thing, I'm choosing to be here, so therefore, you know, halfway across the world from what I knew, and and now, like, you know, it's been 10 years on and off that I've been here, so this, this is becoming a, definitely has become, and became very quickly, a home away from home, um, but I, I choose to be here, I'm here by choice, so this is not where my family's keeping me you know I think sometimes culturally like people don't want to move away because of family or like obligations and so forth I don't have that so these are this is my decision to be here so I want to make the most of my choices and I think that's also something that my approach to life is you know like I'm I I never want to feel obligated or held down by a job or so forth I'm a biggest believer is like soon as I don't want to wake up and go to work and don't like what I'm doing then I leave because it's not good for me. It's not good for the workplace. It's not good for the people that I work with. I'm, I'm out. I'll find something else. So, yeah, I want to make the most of little choices, big choices. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my words of wisdom, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we've come to the end of our first episode, and Woo! in the end of every episode. I want to talk a little bit about something new that you've done recently, something new you've said yes to, and uh, something new you want to try. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Something new that I've done lately. Okay. This year has been 2018. Um, You know what? Like... To be honest, and not to be too cliche, is I have really I've learned to love this year. I think, yeah. I I don't know if that's something that I. I mean, you can't teach yourself to love, can you? But I think that I have um, put my guard down, as you know, you can talk we talked about earlier being a guarded person but I think something that I've done this year is yeah really just gone okay yeah I I'm going to be okay with letting myself go and falling in love and being okay with with uh being loved and I don't know whether like previous to this if I it's been a guarded thing or it hasn't been a right thing, but this is definitely something that's happened this year where I'm like doing the, throw my hands up. I'm like, this is a thing that's happening and I'm letting go and I'm falling. And I guess that's, that's something new. Yeah, maybe it's a bit late in life for myself to learn to do or be okay with doing. Um, but I think that that's the point of the podcast. It's like a, there's never an age, never, a right yeah. age for anything. You just yeah. kind of, when I mean, an opportunity also, comes, yeah, you just kind of take it. Absolutely, I think it. it's it's time, it's place, it's person. It's like you know where you are in your your life. You know, I think back to my <clears throat> you know younger days of like you know did I really ever you know love fully or like let myself be loved or you know throw myself into to something and. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that I've done this this year. It's been recent. 
What was it? Is there a part two to that question? Part two was something new you want to try. Mm, okay. Something new I want to try. Let's see how I quickly segued out of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so awkward. Um, something new I want to try. Oh, wow. Aside from being on a podcast, I just made your dream come true. It's yeah, weird. yeah. I mean, I don't know what's left. Um, something new I want to try. Um, well, there's always things like, uh, well, I think for me is, mm, is, it's just, I, when I think about new, I want to try is just like new places. I feel like I want to go. That's perfect. Yeah. So I have, you know, yeah, there's things I want to do and experience, um, and places I want to go to. And I think that's. Where's the next place you'd like to go to? Well, I've always had on my list. Um, the Zion National Park in Utah. It's where I watched, if you've ever seen the movie 127 Hours where the guy gets stuck and yeah. chops oh, off his arm. Such an intense Super movie. Super intense movie. <laughs> gross. What so my great. takeaway was, that place is so beautiful. It was pretty like <laughs> I want to yeah. go and climb some boulders and hopefully not get stuck. But, yeah. <laughs> Just go with someone. That's his problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll take someone with me. So that's, that's high on the list. Um, I don't know. I also have... Um, an interest in, in going around to like different big cities in the US and um, that I haven't been to and, and seeing more theater around the US. I think that's nice. something that adding to the list. So they're not necessarily new, new things, but it'll be new once I would get there kind of thing. Like, yeah, it's not, eh, no one would expect, uh, it wouldn't be unexpected for anyone for me to go, I want to travel. So it's not like I want to travel and that's new, but I think, uh, you know. No, but a new place. New destination. Yeah. Because everywhere you travel, even if you travel to the same place, a place that you've been to before, it's still a new experience. Yeah, absolutely. I want to try some new ciders. Uh, That's always something on my list. Um, When I traveled the world, I tried pizza in every single place that I went to. So. Nice, that's good. Ciders in every place sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially if it's hot. You're just like, oh. yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what if there's anything on a smaller scale that I want to That's try. perfect. Okay. That's perfect. Okay, good time. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Brie. Thanks for doing this. You're welcome. You're my first episode. Wiki, wiki, wow. <laughs> Thanks again for listening to our first episode of the We're So Young podcast. I want to take a moment to give a special thanks to Vinnie Hamilton, who wrote and composed the theme music for our podcast. Sean Marin, also known as The Kiddo, who did the graphics for our logos and merchandise. And Morgan Parker, who is the photographer for all the content on the website and our socials. Also... Happy, happy birthday to David Manley, who is celebrating today. Don't die on your trip. You're kind of all right. (laughs) Like what you've been hearing? Help spread the word. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Rate, review, and tell your friends about We're So Young. And don't forget to follow us on our socials, at We're So Young Podcast on Instagram, at We're So Young Pod on Twitter, and We're Still Young Podcast on Facebook. Let's all get inspired to try new things together. That's it for now. Tune in on the 1st and the 15th of each month for new episodes. Until then, step out of your comfort zones and try new things, because we're so young.